Hello and good day everyone. This is Jason Strait with the PASS Cloud Virtual Group. Uh, our presentation today is Azure Data Factory Ingestion Framework with Sean Vorgach. And before we get going today, I have a few announcements. The first is that this uh, virtual group is brought to you by Quest Spotlight Cloud. Spotlight Cloud is the first Azure hosted database performance monitoring solution focused on SQL Server customers. Leveraging the scalability, performance, and built-in security of Microsoft Azure Cosmos DB, Spotlight combines the best of the cloud with Quest's engineering insights from years of building database performance management tools. And for those of you on the call that were, or on the webcast, that were uh, are, are part of the mailing group for our uh, virtual group, you probably did receive an offer that Quest has made to all of us. Uh, as, as members of this virtual group as part of their sponsorship, uh, which can allow you to do some of uh, some testing of monitoring through Spotlight Cloud. And I encourage everyone to check that out if you have the opportunity. Over the next few weeks, we have plenty of sessions coming up. A couple of them that I do want to highlight is on July 18th, we have a new session that's scheduled with uh, Warwick Rudd uh, for Azure Data Studio. And then also the August Sixth presentation is a uh, rescheduled um, that I believe was originally scheduled for July 25th. So if you're looking for the big data architectures, that actually did get moved. If you are interested in presenting, uh, we are always looking for more presenters. I'm trying to get uh, the rest of August and September um, loaded up with presenters. So if you are interested, please reach out at cloud.pass.org. And alternatively, if you wanted to, you can go out to the cloud.pass.org website and click on the call for sponsors, I mean, call for speakers to uh, get your submission in. Coming this fall is Pass Summit 2019. Uh, as part of Pass Summit 2019, there's new learning pathways. These learning pathways allow you to go from a beginning level within a topic all the way up to advanced knowledge. And it's a good way to just go to the Pass Summit and, and get some really hardcore learning going on. If you are interested in learning more about Learning Pathways, out on the Pass Summit 2019 page, there is a link to Learning Pathways. If you have not registered yet for the Pass Summit, uh, you can leverage our discount code. That discount code right there on the screen allows you to get $150 US off of your registration. And if you haven't registered and you're planning on doing so in the next two or three days, I do definitely encourage you to use to use that uh, registry, that uh, discount code. And part of the reason being is that between now and uh, June 30th, anyone that has registered with that discount code would be put into a drawing for a chance at a gift certificate um, from our uh, sponsor Quest. Additionally, for the webcasts going on through today, well, actually through June 30th, but this is the last one that, you know, within that session, uh, we have been giving away to attendees, um, to two attendees, um, $25 gift certificates. And, that, and those um, get sent out after the sessions. This virtual group is part of a large number of other virtual groups that pass uh, helps to build, support, and maintain. Uh, these focus on um, areas within the community like women in technology, uh, helping people with career development like professional development, or there are language focused virtual groups like Ch Global Chinese and Global Italian. Throughout the session you may have questions. Uh, if you do have questions, there's a questions panel that's part of the GoToWebinar uh, uh, device. Uh, you can just click on that for a question type that in and at the end of the session, we'll go through all of those questions and give Sean a chance to answer them. And at this time, I'm gonna hand things over to Sean and make him the presenter for today's presentation, Azure Data Factory Ingestion Framework. Thanks, Jason. All right, you are now the presenter. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yep, I can see it. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here, as long as I can. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sean Forgach. Uh, I'm a senior consultant at a company called Avanade, uh, focused specifically on Microsoft uh, technology. 
I primarily deal with data strategy, big data, and data warehousing. Uh, I've uh, been involved in PASS since 2016. I was uh, president of the Wisconsin PASS chapter up in Appleton and Green Bay, Wisconsin. I have uh, all my data management certifications from Microsoft. I could probably update this slide for the new uh, role-based certifications. Uh, I currently live in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I was previously in Milwaukee for a few years, originally from down by St. Louis, Missouri, actually, and I like to spend a lot of my time running and lifting and staying in shape. Uh, it keeps me uh, uh, in tune with my job. So today we're going to be talking about building a data factory ingestion framework and the primarily problem that arose in my uh, in the projects that were, were coming my way were we needed to enable data science. Um, a lot of the data that we were getting into the lake um, was unstructured or it was a lot of data or we needed to centralize the data for a group of scientists to actually explore that data in an easy fashion. And so what I eventually built was a, an ingestion framework, which really stemmed from my experience with ETL automation with data warehousing. So a lot of those same practices that we do with ETL automation, for instance, with uh, tools like BIML, where we automate the development of SSIS packages, you're going to see a lot of that uh, throughout this presentation and see in how we can automate data factory. So a little rundown of uh, the uh, agenda for today is I'm going to do a quick intro to Data Factory. won't spend too much time there. I just want to give a quick introduction uh, to people who may not be familiar with Data Factory and, and just to understand its capabilities and how it is a little different from SSIS. Then we're going to get into the kind of concept of what data lake ingestion is and how that's different from just specifically data integration. After that, we'll get into the conceptual architecture for the actual ingestion framework, the metadata model that's going to drive uh, the data factory pipelines that actually retrieves metadata, puts it into a metadata model, and then we go and look at that metadata to actually go and capture our data and land it into a lake or some other target system. And then a few other rules uh, highlight some of the the features I'm using to actually manage uh, the entire process. So what is Data Factory? Uh, real quick for people who aren't familiar with this, primarily and originally it was develop developed as a data orchestration tool. So in Azure, once we got to the cloud, our compute was separated from our storage. And so this was developed so that we could use different storage systems alongside different computes to, uh, to integrate data throughout our various systems. Um, now, with the recent features that were added, such as data flows, which is really Databricks under the hood, it actually adds that transformation piece back into uh, the tool as, as native functionality. It's also scalable, so we can develop single patterns that actually scale out to up to, um, we can process tables and batches of 50, for example, um, whereas in the past with SSIS, if we're doing ETL automation, we would actually be developing 50 packages instead of a single package that could do that work. Other things, it has monitoring and scheduling built in, um, as well as some other features. At a high level here, we have uh, Data Factory in the background is a bunch of JSON code. With SSIS, uh, just for comparison, um, everything in the back end of SSIS was XML code. And so w for Data Factory, we have four primary entities. We have, uh, we have pipelines, we have activities, data sets, and linked services. And so one primary component that I found if I wanted to build a framework was I wanted to build it around a data set because if I'm going to be ingesting files, I'm going to be ingesting tables. Those tables may come from SQL Server, they may come from Oracle or SAP, etc. That is going to be agnostic across all my use cases. So uh, Data Factory has a ton of native uh, sources out of the box. With this framework, it the idea is that you don't build out every single source that is out there, um, but only the sources that you need, respectively. Um, 
Also, uh, whenever you do add a source to this ingestion framework, I try to align with uh, a native connector that is already in Data Factory. And as you can see here, we have plenty to choose from. So a little little background again on ETL automation, if especially if you're not familiar with this, um, with the SSIS, I'll use that for an example since this is a Microsoft uh, um, technology. Um, what we would do is we would capture metadata, either about our source and target systems, and then we would use that metadata to drive ETL patterns to develop uh, tens or hundreds of ETL packages. Now with Data Factory, the route that we take is instead of building out an individual pipeline for each load, uh, for example, for each target table that we want to load, we can instead build a single pattern and then load an infinite number of tables with that pattern, as long, of course, as uh, the loading pattern is adequate uh, to what we're trying to do. So let me jump over to Data Factory and do a quick demo and introduction. So this is my Data Factory. I'll give a quick uh, tutorial. So this is my home screen. From my home screen, I can create pipelines. I can create pipelines from pre-built templates. I can run through a wizard uh, to do one-time copies and, and uh, data factory setups. And I can directly uh, configure Git uh, with Azure DevOps. And so I have source control integrated. If I go to the little pencil here, this actually takes me to all my existing pipelines and all my development that I would want to do within here. The last button on the left here is to monitor a pipeline, and here I can see all my past pipeline um, ID uh, runs through the schedule. You can see I haven't ran any in a while, so I'm going to go back here. Okay, so I have this first demo here. This is a pretty standard um, pattern within Data Factory. I have two activities here. This first activity is a lookup. Uh, this is just going to run a query on my metadata database. I'm sorry, actually this is just going to run a query on um, a SQL Server database where Adventure Works is stored. And all I'm going to do here is I'm going to get the table schemas and I'm going to concatenate that with the table name so I can get a list of tables. I'm then going to pass that list into this for each activity and it's going to copy each of those tables in parallel. The way I can do that is if I click on settings with that for each, then I click on items, I can reference that previous, if I zoom in here, I can reference that previous activity, the output of that SQL query and pass in the value. If I drill into my for each activity here real quick, I then have a copy data activity, and all this is going to do, it's going to copy, uh, it's going to run a source uh, query on my source SQL Server database. It's just going to do a select star from my current table, and I'm referencing that table name from that item that I passed in. Uh, I'm also surrounding that with um, braces to cast that as a string. So if I pull up Storage Explorer real quick, give me one second. Let me jump over to my data lake in my portal. Go to Data Explorer. Go to my folder called data lake. You can see I have nothing in here. And I'm going to come back to my pipeline. I'm going to hit debug real quick. So what that's going to do, it's going to run that source query on my source SQL server. Then it's passing that list in. You can see now it's copying all those tables in parallel. That is now complete. If I go back to my data lake, let me refresh this. Sometimes this takes a while. I'm 
I now have a folder called raw here. Zoom in a little bit. I have my server name, and then I have schema.table name for each of my tables. So that's just a simple way of how we can do a little bit of automation when ingesting data into a data lake. But from an enterprise perspective, we're going to need to do a lot more. We're going to have a lot of different, more sources. Some of our tables are going to be uh, potentially hundreds of gigs, and we're going to want to do delta ingestion. We're not going to want to copy that entire table every time. We're not going to want to necessarily copy every single table every time we do a load. So I want data sets to be configurable. I want to be able to turn some of them on and some of them off. I want to be able to enable some of them for delta ingestion and some of them to just do full copies. Uh, for example, if it's only 10 records, some sort of reference table, I can just copy that every time, okay? One other thing that is important with the designs that we're going to get into is in order to do dynamic copies like this, an important feature of Data Factory is that linked services can be dynamic. So if I go to my connections, you see here that I have uh, two of them in particular I want to point out. I have ls underscore a sequel and ls underscore sequel. That's a connection for an Azure SQL database, completely dynamic, and then uh, another connection for a SQL Server database that is completely dynamic. And I consider these just templates um, that I use whenever I want to pull data from a Azure SQL database or a SQL Server database. And so these are the two examples that we're going to use in this ingestion framework as I continue to walk through it. Um, we can add on in the future, like I said, um, currently so far in production scenarios, I've done SAP HANA, I've done Teradata, Oracle, uh, a number of SQL servers, of course, uh, as well as a few others such as file systems and such. So if I click on one of these, you can see here on the right, I have a parameter in my uh, domain name property. I have a parameter in my database name property. And then at the bottom here, I have parameters, or these parameters for the linked service. And so if I go back to that demo real quick, and I drill into that copy data activity on my source query here, for this for this first demonstration, I'm only passing in a set value. But when we get to the ingestion framework, what we're going to do with that initial lookup, instead of just getting table names, I'm going to get the connection properties associated with that table name. So then when we go back to that copy, I can be passing in what server it belongs to, what database it belongs to, uh, and user and uh, password secret values uh, if it has a specific um, account that needs to be used for copying that data. So that's just some 101 uh, on how uh, some necessary functionality of Data Factory that allows me to create this ingestion framework. Let me go back to presentation here. So getting into the data ingestion components, um, again, these are things that arose that I needed to account for when designing this ingestion framework. Uh, the for, first one, I've mentioned it once before, delta ingestion. If it's a very large data set, I want to be able to only capture data uh, that has changed, um, typical in ETL, of course. Uh, the organization. So. Um, it's very important to know how you're going to organize your data lake. Typically, I do raw and standard, which lives both across uh, data lake files and some sort of um, big data tables, if you will, such as Hive or Databricks Delta tables, et cetera. Uh, and then volume, uh, we need to account for, um, Again, those, those big data sets and those little data sets. Uh, traceability, so I want um, traceability down to a data set level, um, as well as configuration down to a data set level. 
uh, a little bit uh, just to provide a little bit more context on a, on a typical architecture that I that I take with data lakes um, so like I said you know you have that raw conceptual zone um, and that's your first left orange box there on the left so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to adjust files into the data lake into that raw zone keep the data as is and then the next conceptual zone is a standardized zone the purpose of this is we're going to use some sort of modern format such as Parquet or most recently everything that I've been doing is um, is Delta format so even though it's still Parquet under the hood um, specifically uh, configured for Databricks and so that's that that data is going to be highly compressed and it's going to be more performant and so users are never really going to access the raw zone uh, the purpose of the standards standardized zone is to create a high performance layer of access for those users and then everything pretty much after this becomes specific to your use case so are you going to load a data warehouse are you going to uh, strictly just enable uh, um, functionality for analysts to explore the data that comes after this uh, diagram. The standard zone, so another thing, um, the, the raw, the data we're getting into the raw zone, that's all automated from the ingestion framework. And then a little bit out of scope of this presentation, though I may hit on it, we're also automating ETL and ELT development in the standardized zone. So both the loading of the standardized files, those parquet delta files, as well as the tables and ETL for loading those tables in that standardized zone within Databricks. Curated is, uh, is always going to be optional. Um, it's usually, it's uh, going to be some sort of output uh, to an analysis if that file needs to persist in storage or it needs to be consumed by another system. Uh, however, it will be better to directly write to that system instead of making that additional hop to store it back in the data lake and then pick it up to move it to that other system. So just a little context there. Uh, a little more uh, granularity into that raw zone. So the way I typically organize data is uh, uh, usually first, by I don't have it here, by the source system type. So uh, is it Azure SQL, is it SQL, is it Oracle, or is it SAP, et cetera? And then down to the server and database table name, uh, some sort of date format in the actual data files. So moving on to the conceptual architecture here. Um, again, we have uh, just some various sources here on the left, and then we have two data factory pipelines, only two, there will only ever be two. And then we have in the middle there, the metadata model. And the metadata model is what really is fueling this entire process. So that schema loader, which is just a data factory pipeline, its purpose is to, per source system type, run a schema query. So in SQL Server, that would be something querying the information schema. And that's never really going to change um, per SQL Server. Uh, also, it's very common to have multiple SQL Servers that we want to ingest into Data Lake. Um, in other cases, it's going to be a different system like uh, um, Oracle or a file uh, in a file system. And so that query is going to be, again, specific to the source system type. And then we're going to take the results of those queries and we're going to load the metadata model. The third activity here is the data loader pipeline. And its job is to look at that metadata. There's going to be a stored procedure that knows um, which tables need to be copied um, um, based on certain configuration. And then it's going to go back and look at that source and actually do the copy into data link. So get the schema, load the schema into the model, and then the third pipeline, look at the model to actually go and get the data. So getting into the metadata model, um, 
I initially started small. I started just with an individual table and as requirements grew, I just um, had a few different tables with some configurations. Um, and then I w even from the beginning though, I was still building it around the idea of a data set. No matter if it's a SQL data set, an Azure SQL data set, et cetera, eventually if I wanted to mature mature this, I wanted to build it in a data vault model. And without getting into data vault and the specifics, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll quickly highlight what it is. Um, it's typically used in data warehousing. Um, and most importantly, it's usually used to uh, capture, um, uh, create a layer of access about, uh, for our source systems. And so you have a hub table there in the blue and that represents our entities. We have satellite tables, which um, represents our attribute information. Uh, business keys are separated from the attribute information. So those hub tables are only gonna store the key information. And then you have link tables, which can link uh, uh, hub tables together. And that's our transactional type data. Uh, if you want to go learn more about Data Vault, um, go to go buy this book uh, first and foremost. It has everything you need to know about it. Um, learn Data or uh, and follow Daniel Lindstad. He's the original creator for Data Vault. So, getting into um, an example of the model here now in enterprise scenarios. Whoops. Uh, I have a definitely more robust model with many more tables, um, but I want to highlight, let me go out to my little cool new tool here. I can zoom in. So again, previously I said everything evolves around a data set. So the one and only, I'm sorry, um, one of the hubs that is used in this model is hub data set. And so we're creating a record here for uh, to represent each distinct data set. Again, source agnostic. My satellites for my hub include tables such as, uh, one of the important ones is an options table with a bunch of bit columns. And that's where I'm controlling flags for disabling, enabling ingestion, enabling partition automation, uh, or delta ingestion, et cetera. And again, you can do whatever you want for your scenario. Uh, a, call, a table for capturing column information. So um, once we get into automating the ETL piece and Databricks, you're, you're going to need that. Um, identifying primary keys, etc. And so whenever you add a new source, there's a few objects that you need to add and you only need to add it once per source type. So if we have 100 SQL servers that we want to add in, we need to add the type of SQL server. And so we're going to add a satellite table called um, sat dataset type SQL. That's just the naming convention I'm following. And so the abbreviation, I try to uh, align with data factories abbreviations, which usually can be, uh, be found in the JSON code. And so for this one, this is just the on-prem SQL servers. Um, and that's just capturing uh, certain metadata that I want to store or that is required for that system. There is also a staging table. So when I, um, I query the metadata from a SQL Server system, I'm landing it here. And then there's a procedure that actually loads the Data Vault model. And I'm going to do that for every source type that I need. So that was for SQL Server. This one's for Azure SQL. Um, these are considered two different connections in Data Factory, um, although I could get it to work, of course, with uh, one connection. It um, technically is considered a different type of connection. And another reason I uh, chose that, um, originally I was writing one query to get the metadata from every database on a server, but that's not going to work in Azure, of course. So again, if you're going to add like SAP, for example, you're going to have a satellite table and then another staging table. Uh, 
couple other things here. So there's a, the only link table that is being used is to tie um, a relationship between a data set and a connection. So I have a hub linked service here, which is um, keeping track of connections. I have a store procedure that will load a connection. So whenever I want to add, if I have 10 SQL servers, for example, that I want to add, I'm going to run that store procedure 10 times with the appropriate um, properties. And it's going to load this, and then you're going to tie it back to the data sets that it relates to. So loading the model, um, like I said, you have that staging table. Uh, one thing I did not mention yet is you on those staging tables, we're also going to build a view. And the purpose of that view is to primarily generate the hash keys, which is specific to data, the data vault modeling technique. Um, and then the load procedure that actually loads the model, it's going to look at those views instead of the individual staging tables. And we'll get into the actual code here, action soon. All right, let me jump back into SQL Server, and I'm just going to run through what some of this data looks like. So I have my metadata model here called adf.metadata. Let me zoom in on this. So I'm just going to walk through some of these objects. So one of the first ones is, you know, after I've captured all this metadata, um, I pre-ran the schema loader, um, and it's just pulling from uh, an on-prem wide world importers database I have on my laptop, uh, and that system type is SQL. Um, I have Adventure Works up in Azure SQL where I'm pulling some uh, information from there. Um, and so I'm creating certain views so I can see uh, a holistic um, view of all my data sets regardless of the source system type. And then an example of some of my staging tables. Um, again, nothing fancy going on here. I'm just capturing um, server names. Uh, is it a table? Is it a view? Table name full. So this is how Data Factory requires the table name to be passed in, so uh, schema.tableName wrapped in brackets. So I'm going, I'm uh, generating that um, from the beginning uh, just so I can have that down the pipeline. Database name, schema, uh, column information, etc. Typical metadata for SQL Server. Uh, the next one is the view I mentioned, so we're generating a, a business key as well as the uh, a hash key to identify a unique table, and then also one more hash key to identify a unique column on that table, and that's going to help with our loading into the model. Um, a few other things here, so here's the hub data set table. Um, like I said before, we're just capturing um, the key information. Uh, the source system key identifier, so SQL Server, Azure SQL in, in this demonstration, and then where that record came from. Here is that options table I mentioned, um, and these are just some of the things that are currently automated in my demonstration model. Uh, is the data set enabled? Um, do we want to enable Delta? Um, Pretty much any property that is, can be um, dynamic in Data Factory, you can add it on here uh, and configure it down to the data set level and feed it back to Data Factory when you, when you run it. Okay, so I just wanted to provide um, you know, one more here. So this is a, a stored procedure. Oop, not that one, this one. This is a stored procedure that is actually getting all the data, it's pulling it together, and this is what's going to feed the data factory pipeline uh, to automate. So uh, if we have a pipeline, and um, we'll get to it here shortly, it, uh, we're gonna have within a for each, we're gonna have an if condition for each source system. We're gonna say if it's SQL, do this, if it's SAP, do this, et cetera. And then it's just gonna filter that 
this data down to those copy activities. So if it's SQL Server, we're going to pass in this top information here, and this is just everything specific um, that we need. Uh, for example, looking for my connection information. So, okay, yeah, for this one, I'm only using, um, passing in the server and database name because I hard-coded my username and password uh, just for demonstration, but if I were to make it more dynamic, I would pass in an Azure Key Vault secret for the username as well as the password. Okay. So go to getting into the pipeline designs, so I'll hit this real quick because we're going to actually jump into the, the code. Uh, this is the schema loader, so uh, again, the, that first activity that's going to run is just going to get a list of connections that needs to go and retrieve the schema from. We're going to truncate all of our staging tables, and then we're actually going to do it for each where we copy data from each system type. And the final activity is to run a procedure that will load that model. Getting into the data loader, um, now you can see here we have two different paths um, that that data can take. And so that first activity on the left, uh, that get metadata activity, um, that's just going to run that stored procedure that I showed you uh, just now in SQL Server. Uh, we're getting all of our uh, data set uh, information per uh, uh, separated by a source system type and now from here this is going to um, we're going to filter on our top path whether or not it's delta ingestion and in this case and I've done this different ways on different projects but we're just going to uh, essentially use watermark values um, so in order to configure a delta ingestion data set we need a, a valid timestamp column um, and then we're just recording those timestamps, and the next time it runs, we're just going to get all the data um, after that timestamp on that on that next run. And then the very last activity is where we actually go and copy the data. Then we're doing some other things as well as looking at the file we copy to understand like how big it is, um, and then any of the other native. Um, properties that Data Factory allows us to capture. Uh, I think I already walked through this, um, but just to understand a little bit about the dynamic linked services, uh, we have our Data Factory pipeline and then within that pipeline we have a for each activity and from my metadata I showed you before, we can pass in that metadata down to a data set that has parameters and then again down to the linked service that also has parameters. And so that's where how we can pass in those values to these different entities. Um, yep, so just what I mentioned earlier, um, that's how we can, so this is on a data set. These are the properties for a data set. And then I'm referencing um, the server name and database name like I showed you on that SQL uh, store procedure output. Uh, to pass in uh, when it runs this for an individual uh, item. Um, th this is actually, um, I apologize, I meant to modify this. This is how I was originally doing it. I was originally creating patterns uh, within the source query and then feeding in um, that metadata into those query patterns, but uh, I found it much easier now um, to just store the select statements uh, in my options table and pass those in instead. Okay, let's jump over to the data factory pipeline. So this is the schema pipeline that I mentioned. Um, pretty much the same stuff from that original demo. I'm just I'm just querying a table to get my uh, distinct servers. I'm running a stored procedure in this next one that will uh, truncate all my staging tables. Nothing fancy going on there. And then my for each activity. If I drill into that real quick, here I have my if conditions. 
in my two example system types, if Azure SQL and if SQL. And all this is doing is it's looking at this data set that we're passing in and it's saying if it's this, pass in that data set to that copy activity. If it's this, pass it in to the other one. And I can do that by writing a data factor expression um, where I'm basically saying if the server type column equals SQL, do a true condition, which I configure right here. So if I go to edit true, I have my copy data activity. Then in my source here, this is the schema one. So this is my information schema query, which does not change per source system. I'm sorry, uh, it would not change per SQL server source system. And then the final one is just running another store procedure. So I'm not going to run that because I've already ran that one. And then the next one is the actual pipeline to load the data. So if I jump over back to my data lake, um, this is the folder that we loaded from earlier. I'm going to go ahead and run this. It's just going to take a few moments. Now it's starting to copy the data. While it's doing that, it's just going to take a moment. Let me drill into this um, last activity here. I'll just show you some of the other things that I'm doing after I copy the data. Um, and you can add on more to this if you need. Uh, the first one is actually doing the copy. The second one is this native activity called um, get metadata where I am pointing that to the file I just copied. And I'm getting these native properties off of that file and I'm storing that back into the model. So uh, just some metadata, more metadata, column counts, uh, the actual name of the file that was copied because if we're doing delta copies, it's going to have a timestamp appended. How big that file was, that's probably the most important one uh, and a few others. Then the third one is just going to get the, the results of that git load stats uh, activity and it's going to load that back to the metadata. Okay, so let me go back to my data lake here and hit refresh. And now you can see I have three databases in here. I have AdventureWorks, um, I have Actually, I'm sorry, I have uh, two different s computers. I have my laptop and then my Azure SQL server. So if I drill into my Azure SQL server, you can see now that I have AdventureWorks database, some tables that are being copied. If I go back to my local machine, I now have Wide World Importers in there. Azure portal starting to flake out a little bit and all my my tables from that data warehouse. Okay. There's a few more things here before we wrap up. Um, some other objects that I'm creating. Um, I have a view that looks at uh, different sizes of uh, the files and the way I'm using um, the sizes of the files is I set predefined limits so once it gets to a certain size um, I may flag that data set to send to a developer to say this data set now needs to be enabled for uh, delta ingestion. We can no longer copy the whole thing because it's overall our uh, size threshold. 
Uh, and then um, I think I so showed you this one already, um, just a view to bring in all of our different source type data sets under a single view, uh, stuff like that. Uh, other features that, again, I'm not going to be able to go over in this demonstration, but uh, automating ETL development, uh, DDL uh, automation, and data profiling specifically, and Databricks, uh, and also feeding that back into the model. Uh, a few things that ha always becomes an issue um, and uh, it's almost a requirement for doing data ingestion into a data lake at considerable sizes. Uh, you'll want to scale your on-prem integration runtimes. If pulling from an on-prem system, uh, you can add up to four nodes to an integration runtime, including uh, your master node. Uh, designated virtual machines for each of those integration runtimes and also consider express route. Uh, a little bit of contact information. Um, so I, I'm usually on Twitter and I'm usually only sharing my blogs that I write on uh, that website. Uh, and then also if you search for me on LinkedIn, I'm probably gonna be the only one on there because my last name is kind of rare. <laughs> All right, I think we're just at uh, the hour. So, um, Open up for questions. Sure, we yeah, we've got a little bit of time for questions. We got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is uh, just if uh, we can get the slides available for the attendees. They just want to be able to download the slides from the meeting archive. Um, yeah, yeah, I can send it to you. Um, I believe this video will also be available. Correct. Awesome. And then the other question is: Are there options for logging, restarting the ADF framework? Um, you know, in, in the event that there's a failure? From a batch standpoint, so I didn't go over that, but uh, I am in production scenarios, so I have batch tables where, where I'm starting batches and, and ending batches. Um, from data factories point of view, um, if, a data f if a run does not complete, I can actually just go into, I'm not going to have an example here, I'm, don't know why I'm going here, but you can pretty much just hit restart on a failed pipeline. Um, so from my ingestion framework, yes, you need to create batch tables and add that into your pipelines. Okay. And then the next question is, is why did you choose to use Data Vault for metadata modeling? Yeah, so I think that just goes back to the maturity of it. Um, previously, um, I had just created it. Um, a few tables, um, data vault is very clean, it's very pattern oriented, so now I have a pattern where I can um, say go look at how I developed the SQL pattern and mimic that for the new system that we want to add on, like SAP for example. Um, and so if I really wanted to take this far and develop a product around it or something, I could um, automate the creation of adding a new source type to the model. So it's all very pattern oriented is all. Okay, and got a couple questions regarding whether or not you'd be willing to share the framework code that you put together. Um, yeah, I, I, I get that question every time I do this. <laughs> um, I, I'm thinking about putting it up on GitHub at the end of the year after I finish up all my speaking engagements. Um, it'll be just the, the basic um, data vault example and so I would just put up uh, um, like the the DDL in the um, in a ERD diagram. Okay and then regarding the data vault why use a data set hash key and also a data set BK if the data set BK is unique anyways? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I'm not using the business key. Um, I, when I created it, uh, I just wanted to align with um, data vault best practices. Um, so I, uh, throughout the entire process, uh, I've yet to have a use case for the business key. Um, first time I've had that ask, so um, good, good catch. And then the last one we have here, unless we get a couple more, um, what have you used for source system CDC? Are you using something in SQL or Informatica or you know some other tool? Yeah, um, it's been specific to project. Um, I've been lucky enough on some of my current projects where uh, the current method was adequate, so we had 
time we had columns on our source tables that would allow us um, that that were being updated, um, and so we could just use those to to capture um, the actual data that had changed, and then we were automating that ETL um, as it got into the lake. Um, but that is often a um, that would be preferred if you had CDC enabled um, or custom implementation of it. You know, even a, a better, much more, much, much more expensive solution would be replication into a lake, right? Um, you wouldn't have to do all that additional um, CDC type work. All right. And then why use source type and load date both on hub and SAT table? Um, can you repeat that one more time? Sorry for the noise. I'm downtown Chicago. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, why use source type and load date both on hub and SAT tables? I don't think I follow. Um, yeah, I think um, I think he's referring to this. Was it the source system key or? Um, I think we're getting uh, into record this. source. Record source. That's just how I developed it, honestly. Um, I think I I don't use record source a lot. Um, if ever, I may use it on the satellites, but it's uh, along with that business key. Um, it's not something that's been uh, extremely helpful. Um. So I w wouldn't say it's required in, in an implementation. All right. And it looks like that is all the questions that we have so far. Um, and at this time, I'm just going to close things out. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Sean, for presenting. Uh, going into the next few weeks, we do have a lot more presentations to look forward to. So hopefully we will see everyone back for those. And just to finish off, thank you again, Sean. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye.